This afternoon, what we're going to talk about is uh, some of the problems experienced in uh, using exploration geochemistry over the uh, Atacama Desert, trying to see through the gravels to mineral deposits buried beneath it, and uh, one possible strategy or alternative that we can apply to uh, try and improve our rate of success and decrease our um, exploration uh, costs when uh, doing mineral exploration. As I was um, putting this talk together um, over the last uh, couple of days, uh, the thought occurred to me that there are uh, there are probably um, people in the audience who are going to listen to my presentation and say, ah, we're already doing that, brilliant. And there are going to be people sitting here saying, yes, we know there's a problem, that's, that's a good idea, let's go try that. Um, so what this presentation is really aimed at is a large portion of the audience who, um, who uh, do the same thing every year, which is to go out and march around doing soil sampling over the, uh, over the desert in the Atacama without any great deal of thought towards the, uh, the processes by which anomalies might be forming on the surface, and indeed how they might be um, identified through doing some very clever tricks with, um, with exploration geochemical uh, methodologies, and, um, methodologies and data. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Alexander Brown, who's a student of mine, who's uh, working on these various projects uh, with me, who uh, contributed into the presentation as well. Now, this one doesn't work either. <laughs> Yes, a large green button. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll ask you to change the slides in future. Um, it's well known what the uh, trace element distribution is within inside um, porphyry deposits, including obviously the distribution of elements like copper, molybdenum, and gold. And people like uh, Ailey and uh, Tosdale published this model uh, back in 2015, showing the distribution of uh, many trace elements that allows us to, to vertically profile our way through a, uh, through a porph porphyry system in a chemical uh, context. And we know that when uh, porphyry is weathered, that there's a phenomenal number of trace elements can, uh, can be released from the actual uh, porphyry. And we can obviously use those uh, elements, uh, combinations of them, not just simply copper, moly, and gold, to try and find a, uh, a porphyry system. Uh, many of these elements are obviously only anomalous relative to their host. Sometimes the host can actually be more enriched than the mineralized system that uh, come into it. And then we always have to uh, take into consideration what happens chemically to those elements when those elements get released. Um, are those elements actually mobile? Are those elements immobile? Are those elements mobile in the release point when uh, you've got uh, essentially acid rock drainage pulling out uh, elements out of the porphyry? Do they stay mobile through the whole life of that um, transportation system into, uh, into water or do they subsequently get lost and we will never see them? Okay, it was shown many years ago by people such as uh, Esteban Urqueta with his uh, excellent work at uh, Koyoazi that uh, exploration geochemistry in residual terrains works extremely well. We can find porphyries without no great uh, difficulty when we've got access to uh, fresh rock and we can see the alteration around that uh, fresh rock. However, as we all know, in um, Chile, a great deal of what is uh, prospective terrain is, uh, is covered by, um, by transported, uh, transported materials. Um, all the, uh, the light cream stuff here is essentially transported overburden that covers uh, potential uh, areas of interest. And the whole idea of uh, the work that we've been doing is to try and find strategies by which we can do exploration through that material. Um, this is an area that sits to the south of the uh, Cabrada Islada. Um, it's been known at various times as, uh, as Feb 14 de Febrero. That's what it was called when I was working there. But what we're going to use this for is a demonstration of typically what happens when a uh, company goes out and does um, exploration geochemistry over the gravels, hoping to find something buried below. They'll take an area like this, and without a great deal of consideration, they will go in and they'll plump down a uh, geochemical survey. Simple grid, something like a 500 meter 250 meter or 200 meter cell system. They send them out a team. The team will work phenomenally rapid. They will collect a whole set of samples from typically um, 20 centimeter to 10 centimeter depth. Those will get screened to minus 80, sent off to a laboratory, analyzed. The results come back, and somebody else looks at the data to try and pick exploration targets. When that data comes back, very often it looks like that. You find yourself with, a, uh, with an interesting looking target. We have an area where we have a copper anomaly, um, nicely defined. We might even have a, um, a molybdenum anomaly sitting somewhere down here, which causes more confusion because the two aren't together then. However, it gives us a secondary target if the first one doesn't work. 
Um, unfortunately, this is a horribly misleading um, um, process because all they're actually doing is mapping out the background geochemistry of the gravels that are streaming off of these outcrops up here. So here we have andesite. That andesite is putting down 80 ppm typically of background copper across the top of the gravels. Here we have some rhyolites, granodiorites, and they're spilling out molybdenum across the top of the gravels. So most of the time when we're doing simple exploration across the gravels, all we're actually doing is mapping out the geochemistry of the, um, of the gravels. In practice, it achieves very little. It maps the debris slope, down, uh, downslope, of, um, downslope of outcrop. You do get some variation with intensity of the uh, material as it's uh, weathered. And as uh, things like gypsum come into play, they raise or lower the, um, lower the signal. Unfortunately, it's highly unlikely to discover buried mineralization. And then a whole pile of things on the bottom here, it leads to poor decision making, essentially. And probably the only drilling you're going to do to any success is sterilization drilling of deciding you uh, didn't need to go there in the first instance. Can we do a better job of it? OK, we're going to go all the way back now to 2002 to some uh, pretty good work that was done uh, by, um, by Ian Cameron and uh, Matt Laybourne and various other uh, geochemists. This was a study run out of um, Canada that was uh, well documented in a whole pile of uh, papers. They went across to uh, Spence, and uh, they were there before um, any mining activity had taken place. They, uh, they were still doing the feasibility drilling. Um, so none of these pits were there. And they put in a single sample line across what would uh, eventually be the, uh, the open pit area. Uh, they took those samples, again, conventional soil samples, and they did multiple digestions on those, um, on those samples, giving essentially the same results. Uh, what they got from that was a uh, phenomenally beautiful anomaly, uh, very noisy. You'll see it's very, um, very spiky, goes up, goes down, sitting directly over the top of the mineralization in a whole range of uh, elements, including a particular interest, things like chlorine, bromine, iodine, and sodium, which were uh, highly soluble uh, elements, sit typically, sitting around as, uh, typically sitting around as salt. And they hypothesized that what we were actually seeing here was nothing more than the movement of groundwaters of fractures that extended from bedrock into the uh, into the, gravel, um, into the gravel cover. Um, they also took uh, samples of the, uh, the groundwater from the drilling program that was there at the time. And uh, very quickly, you can establish that there's a link directly between what we're seeing in the, uh, the groundwaters and with what we're seeing on the, um, on the surface. So that came to their, uh, their final model, which we've taken and modified even further. The tool we were looking at is a case of nothing more than saline-rich groundwaters containing metal that has been taken out of the porphyry system by, uh, simply by uh, contact and has been pumped to the surface by uh, seismic pumping. Seismic pumping being either simple uh, dilation uh, activities or being um, collapse of pore space due to uh, collapsing of uh, fine sediment into, uh, into the spaces in the, uh, into the gravel. They um, suggested a, uh, oops, sorry, that one, one. They suggested a, um, they suggested a system of undertaking 25-meter uh, sample spacing, which uh, I think was the, uh, the killing point of the work that they'd done, because uh, nobody in their right mind is going to do any regional district or even target scale exploration at 25-meter scales to try and find, uh, to try and find a, um, a deposit. The, uh, the cost of that type of work would be uh, phenomenally expensive. And the evidence that their uh, processes uh, are active in many areas is very clear when you wander around the desert. Go look in any um, cutting down the side of a uh, down the side of the gravels, and you'll find these feature-like fractures that are often aligned with gypsum, and often on the top of them, you can see the continuation of those fractures going across the, uh, the actual gravel surface. Okay, so I mean, identify the association between the, uh, the presence of the structures and um, the movement of groundwater up those structures. The question comes in, can we do a better job than just ashing out to the desert, putting in a grid, and instead target structures so that we no longer um, um, just randomly put samples everywhere. We look for very specific features, which are structures, and we do uh, geochemistry over those. We have a whole pile of very cheap um, um, satellite imagery available to these days in the form of uh, Google Earth and uh, Google Pro, where we have some very, very high uh, resolution satellite imagery that is uh, phenomenally good over the uh, Atacama Desert. And with uh, some clever um, data stretching uh, techniques or image stretching techniques, you can improve the resolution on those images and actually um, identify structures that are traversing the uh, gravels from active tectonics very, very easily. Um, that's not the only data that's available. Uh, we used a drone on one of our projects to uh, 
do a very high resolution uh, mapping of the surface. And obviously, if you've got LIDAR, you can pull out very, very subtle, uh, see, uh, subtle um, signatures of uh, Earth movement on the top. This is an area that sits to the um, sits to the uh, east of uh, east of Kalama, and downslope direction is in uh, this direction. The first time I saw this image, I actually thought it was the join between two Google images, but in fact, I've actually been there and stood on the edge of this um, on the edge of this area. And what we're seeing there is a huge structure that travels all the way across here. This structure is over 15 kilometers long, going um, directly east west of uh, Chukikamata. And if you go and plug in on Google Earth tonight, you can identify this structure really really quickly. When you stand on the edge here, this is a drop of about five meters, and that five meters is on the upslope side. So that's quite a uh, that's quite a phenomenal um, quite a phenomenal shift. So we can identify those structures in the field. We can use those structures, obviously, now to use target our geochemistry. Uh, this is another example. This is one um, down in the uh, south of Chile. So now we're, well, not the south of Chile, the southern end of the Atacama Desert. We're now um, 70 kilometers to the northeast of um, Copiapo. Uh, this is an image I just randomly dragged out of Google Earth uh, while uh, scanning through the, uh, the data. So uh, really, really easy to pick. But you can see there, if you look down here, there's a feature that comes down there, runs down there, through the middle there, and then off to the side here. And there's actually a displacement on that feature down the bottom there. Uh, when we zoom in, you can see all what's happened here is there was a scarp here, a fault scarp, and that fault scarp has now been cut through by subsequently by these um, valleys that are traveling from the, um, the west, uh, sorry, east through to the west, and they give us this, um, what I call it, like a ripple texture that's identifying the presence of, um, the presence of that fault. And eventually, of course, we can start some light, sticking some lines on the uh, images. We can even put the down throw side on, the, on this side of the fault and where it's appropriate to even put in um, cross-fault structures. If we wanted to do um, exploration geochemistry along those, how might we do it? Well, we're looking for porphyries that we know are fairly big um, deposits, so we don't need to do uh, super dense sampling along those features. We could, for example, go to an area like this and every 250 meters or so put in a very short line that effectively crosses that feature. And then what we're looking for on those features are those geochemical signatures of waters that have been forced to the surface that have interacted with porphyry mineralization and brought some of that signature up to the um, up to the surface. Um, so some very simple uh, guidelines there is we're targeting structures, obviously. Uh, we're doing uh, wide space lines, close space samples across those. Always sampling the oldest surface because we're looking at a time accumulated signature. Every time there's an earthquake that forces water to the surface here, that water brings some of that um, signature to the surface. If we have um, erosion for our new channels cutting through, those new channels now contain young material. That signal gets lost away and, um, lost away and actually, uh, actually lost. And typically, we're measuring, oops, wrong one. Typically, we want to measure the conductivity as well because we were looking for evidence of those waters coming to the, uh, coming to the surface. And that obvious evidence that water came to the surface is going to be left behind in the form of, uh, of the presence of um, salt on the surface, which um, we can then identify with uh, really, really high uh, conductivities. And then because we don't want to see so much of the, uh, the lithology uh, signature, uh, using a fairly weak digest is, uh, is superior to attacking it with a strong digest. Good. We can do predictive chemistry. We can actually start to identify what elements we might see on the uh, surface. There was a whole pile of elements I showed you uh, on about slide three, and uh, using um, very simple um, diagrams of, uh, or Purbe diagrams of EH versus pH, we can predict in typical Chilean groundwaters what are those elements we're likely to see at the surface, which ones we're unlikely to see. And very quickly, you can see that elements like arsenic is, and uh, elements like molybdenum, they're floating around the groundwaters as, um, as oxyanions. They're not cations anymore, they're oxyanions, and they're highly mobile, whereas elements such as uh, copper at this point, uh, they're highly immobile. Uh, we wouldn't expect to see copper. And that's really important because um, these things we will see on the surface. Copper, which is in many instances the prime element we're chasing, is one that we're least likely to see on the surface unless we're directly on the top of mineralization such as that, um, such as that, uh, such as that spent. And that's going to be a struggle because trying to convince an exploration manager that he's going to drill an anomaly, arsenic, selenium, telenium anomaly, and not drill the copper anomaly is always going to be a, uh, is always going to be a push. But that's the way that chemistry works, and we have to take cognizance of that. So um, one, of, uh, one of the various groups that we're doing uh, research with, um, they allowed me to uh, pull out this set of data, which is a set of data they did over a project area um, several years ago to, to demonstrate that, in fact, you can see these features even in uh, some of this um, 
uh, more randomly orientated uh, data. They uh, went to a, uh, an area, I'm not going to tell you where the location is, and you'll see the grid coordinates are also uh, missing. I'm sure some people can identify it. They went to an area and uh, they put in a 250 meter uh, offset grid across the complete license block that they had. Uh, we have a whole pile of outcrop coming down the side here. There's some scarn outcrop on these um, hills. There's some gravels that's derived from Mandesats running down the middle here, and then there's another huge fan coming down the um, coming down the side here. So their grid covers a whole range of um, whole range of different materials. Um, the first thing we want to do is uh, obviously take out the outcrop samples because anything sitting on the outcrop we're going to identify really easily and in fact the geochemical anomalies for the outcrop are, uh, are definitely not what we would consider, um, what we would consider um, subtle. Having removed those, the next trick to do is to remove the samples that are on gravels that are being derived from the outcrop because they're obviously going to carry mineralization signature and then any gravels that are sitting over uh, or are formed from very young drainages because in those instances we will, have, uh, we will have lost the signature. When we remove all of those samples and reprocess the data, lo and behold, we pick up three samples sitting down the bottom here, all of which are uh, very high conductivities because they contain a lot of um, salt in the uh, sample material, and they're all containing a range of elements that are of great interest to us like molybdenum, selenium, and um, arsenic that have been brought up to the surface by, um, by the groundwater, being tectonically pumped up through, um, up through structures. Um, for those who have ever been to this area, um, this here is a very clearly defined uh, fault structure. Uh, you go there and stand there, this is a two meter uh, difference between this side and the, um, and the upside slope. So um, fortuitously, by chance, they happen to take three samples sitting over the outcrop of, uh, or the subcrop of mineralization that contain this type of signature. Now, that's brilliant. However, there's all these other samples that were taken that were effectively um, uh, very inefficient and, um, and a little bit of uh, waste of um, waste of money. Had a um, different approach come in and very short sample lines been put across the structures after identifying the structures and perhaps other structures that are also running up through these uh, various bays, uh, they could have saved themselves a lot of um, surface exploration money and found, um, found, the, target, um, found the target much, uh, much easier. Good, so in summary, um, grid style patterns, um, stamping across the gravels is, uh, is what I would consider as value destructive. You're spending money with very little, uh, very little return on it. Um, it was very interesting to the talk on renovation earlier on because uh, you only have to walk around the desert as I did many, many years ago doing grid style geochemical sampling. And you can often see that other people have been there before you and after you've wandered a while, you can see three or four different surveys belonging to different companies that have done exactly the same thing over exactly the same area. Because that data never gets archived, nobody ever knows that it's already been previously unsuccessfully, uh, success, unsuccessfully attempted. But uh, we should stop doing that. Um, pattern drilling was, was a thing much used in the uh, past, can be productive, but it's obviously inefficient and uh, expensive. Um, the work from the early 2000s demonstrated this process actually works, and it's not just that uh, the piece of work that demonstrated it. Uh, Carmina Holkera demonstrated it with her research on the, the MSC. It's been shown at uh, Gabi, um, Gabi as well. And indeed, my current student has uh, done exactly the same thing. We see a constant repetition of the same pattern. Structures are key to the identification of porphyries through, um, through the gravels. We can identify those active structures because they form geomorphological features once they uh, move on the, um, on the surface. And we can sample along those structures, pulling out the oldest gravels, using weak uh, digests, and um, from that, using some clever thoughts about uh, geochemistry, try to identify where mineralization is, um, is present by the fact that that uh, chemical signal has now been brought to the surface. Down to 59 seconds. Good. So in the conclusion or summary to that, um, we, um, that, that was the concept we started with two years ago. And we tried that and it worked really well, but we pushed that a lot further. And uh, we've now pushed it down to a, a very specific technique with a very specific digest, um, chasing a very specific um, type of texture in the, um, in the material that we, uh, the sample that's been really successful. But unfortunately, that's the bit I can't tell you about because that's tied up in a confidentiality agreement. So uh, in a year's time, uh, we can tell you all about exactly how to do that, uh, that type of exploration. But just changing from current grids to targeted sampling across structures coming through the gravels makes a profound step change. Thank you.